I'm delighted to share more news about the Democratic Republic of Congo uh, because this country has grown dear to my heart. I will give you some insight information which is not covered by the mainstream media. As you hear my story, you will uh, understand why this news is not being talked about in the media. Next, I will let you know what my wife Lenka and I are doing to help the people in this country. Thirdly, I will talk about a subject which I believe will benefit all of us in the south or in the north, wherever we live. I would like to start out with a question. Is anybody here who does not have a mobile phone? It looks like everybody has one. Anybody here who also does not have a laptop or a desktop computer? Everybody has one. See, you might be surprised to find out when you use such equipment that you have a connection to the Republic of Congo. Because in your mobile phone and in your computer, there is a, a rare and expensive mineral called coltan. And most coltan used today comes from the Congo. You also have a connection to this country if you own a car, because your car battery is made with another expensive material, cobalt. And about two-thirds of the world's reserves are in the Congo. Congo is a huge country. It's almost 30 times the size of the Czech Republic. The approximately 80 million inhabitants can be divided into about 200 ethnic groups with about 400 smaller languages and four major languages, the official language being French. The main local language is called Lingala. And if you want to say hello to a Congolese and you say Mbote, you will make him or her very happy. Half of the population is Catholic, 20% belong to various Protestant churches, 10% are Kimbangists, a local church, 10% are Muslim, and 10% follow traditional religions. According to the Human Development Index of the United Nations, which records the human development level of the nations in the world, the DR Congo has been rated amongst the lowest of the 187 countries on the list for many years. Millions of Congolese children, about half of the school-age children, have no access to schools, either because there are no schools around where they are, or because their parents are too poor to pay the mandatory school fees. Despite these long-standing problems, the Congo has a lot of potential because the Congolese don't easily take no for an answer. They live under very difficult circumstances, yet most of the time they do not give up. I've never seen a country with so many old and dilapidated cars and vans, and when one of these old vehicles stalls in the middle of the traffic, which happens quite often, or if it doesn't want to ignite, they push it until it starts. If a small truck is stuck on a sandy road, even uphill, they keep pushing until it regains its grip and moves. In the capital, Kinshasa, many babies are abandoned either on the street or in front of an orphanage that barely makes ends meet. My wife Lenka and I adopted one such baby when she was one week old. Anissa is now 10 years old and since she had the opportunity she was able to develop her talents. She speaks English and Czech fluently and learns German with me. She likes skiing, ice skating, inline skating and basically any kind of sport. We are thankful for the good education she receives at the Elias school nearby. Anissa proves how much potential lies in the African continent if its children are given a chance to develop their talents. The Congolese members of our local association in Congo, ADH Congo, are the backbone of our work there. They are a talented group of Congolese who wish to bring their country up to the standard it is supposed to be. 
On this photo, you can see from left to right CEO Gilbert Couli, Engineer Jean Vita, Professor André Kapanga, and Professor François Mpona. In many parts of the world, you find big differences between rich and poor. However, in Africa, and especially in the Congo, that difference is gigantic. Poverty is unimaginable there and affects the majority of the population. I will give more details later about their poverty level. Corruption and lobbying exist everywhere also. However, if a billion dollars disappear in a poor country into the pockets of the elite, the effects are far more far-reaching. After all, their total budget is only a fraction of the money which the industrialized countries have at their disposal. Some Congolese work very hard, like, for example, the men who push heavy loads by bike many kilometers through the bush, or those who work with a pushcart called puspus, which can carry heavy loads. They push with all their might, wearing an old pair of flip-flops, and during the rainy season, they sometimes go through mud and huge puddles because there is no other way to the destination. On the other hand, there are reasons why many Congolese are unable to work as efficiently as their counterparts in the Northern Hemisphere. Heat and rain play a role in many people's working life, and there are other influences like a lack of education, motivation, and training. An Indian overseer of a construction site in Kinshasa told me once why he had to repeatedly point out the same things to local laborers. He put himself into their shoes and explained why they had so little motivation to do a better job. He said something like this, imagine you had no breakfast and you will not eat much, if any, lunch either. You had very little or no schooling and job training. You work all day in the heat for a monthly salary of about $100, which is not even remotely enough to take care of your family and to send your children to school. When you get uh, sick, then you have to pay all your bills because you're not insured. Uh, that's why, actually, most of the time you cannot even see a doctor or buy any medicine because you just don't have the money for it. And therefore, when you are sick, many times you have to keep working. How hard would you work under such conditions? So some people work for a long time in their jobs without receiving any payment because uh, they hope that one day they will receive a salary. About 80% have no jobs with regular income. Many salespeople roam the city, they buy goods in a shop and then they stand on the street all day trying to sell them with a little profit so that their family has something to eat that evening. Some are quite inventive, like this man who sells eggs. He carries about 70 eggs on his head like this, walking down the street without holding on to them with his hands. If you want to have an egg, he takes down the whole contraption, uh, peels the egg with a clean plastic bag, adds some spices, if you like, serves it to you, takes the payment and up goes the whole thing on his head again. I think it's fabulous. In Kinshasa, many utility appliances for water and electricity still exist from the colonial era and can break down any time. Usually, water and electricity are cut several times a day. When the power turns off, the rich people turn on their generators. All others light a candle if it is dark. To cook, they pull out a little ka charcoal stove and continue cooking as if nothing happened. It is admirable how flexible and patient those people are. I noticed uh, that Anissa's school was closed recently for a day because water in that part of Prague was cut off. If you would apply this standard to the Congo, most schools there would have to be closed all the time. As, for example, in the countryside, nobody has running water. 
The same with electricity. In some countries, it makes headlines when they have a blackout. But most people in Congo live all their lives without electricity. One time in Kinshasa, we had an extra long power cut for three days, and we had to cook all the food in the fridge and in the refrigerator to keep it from spoiling. Everybody in Congo knows that the biggest need is in the countryside, where almost two thirds of the Congolese live. Besides having no electricity and no running water, they also have no solid roads and not enough or proper schools. They are deprived of the necessities and conveniences that we take for granted in other parts of the world. In addition, because there are few jobs available, they possess little to no money. Diseases cause further difficulties in these remote areas. Malaria alone causes more uh, deaths than AIDS, especially in the countryside. Decent health care is lacking, and inadequately trained doctors likewise contribute to the high mortality rate. Many villagers cannot afford medical examinations in a faraway hospital, nor buy medicine. Basic knowledge of hygiene is missing because nobody teaches them these things. Some become sick from the water they drink. You might wonder why the situation is so dire there. Why do they lack enough schools? And why are the schools they have in such bad condition? Why do people have no money to send their children to school? Why do poor parents have to pay for school lessons at all? How can all this be the case in a country that is one of the richest in the world in natural resources? Besides coltan and cobalt, Congo holds oil, diamonds, copper, tin, uranium, and many other natural and mineral resources, all in highest quality and huge quantities. With the Congo River alone, they could generate enough electricity through its natural force and amount of water to power half, if not all, of Africa. To understand the many problems in Congo, it helps to know the historical development of this country. Dr. Shalwa Nur served 16 years in the Congo as the director of the biggest German development organization. Then she taught for 10 years as an associate professor political science for African regional studies at the Free University in Berlin. She gave me the following insight into the Congo, which I render here in a simplified version. We all know about the terrible history of the slave trade and the colonization of Africa. The bloodiest chapter in this history was the reign of the violence established in Congo since the Berlin Conference in 1885, when Congo became, listen to this, the private property of the Belgian King Leopold II. Imagine one person owning this whole country. Under his 23-year rule, about half of the population, more than 10 million people died. Many workers, including women and children, in the rubber plantations could get their hands and feet chopped off if they did not collect enough rubber. After King Leopold, the Belgian government controlled Congo by less barbaric methods, but by equally oppressive colonial rule and continued to steal Congo's raw materials until formal independence in 1960. Shortly after independence, Mobutu ruled Congo as a horrible dictator for more than 30 years, supported by the US and Belgium. In 1997, Laurent Kabila and his allies from Uganda and Rwanda chased out Mobutu with their army. When Father Kabila did not deliver the raw materials in Congo to his allies, it sparked a war between these countries and Congo. In 2003, this war stopped officially, but in reality it continues in eastern Congo until today. In the last 21 years, around 9 million people died 
either as a direct consequence of fighting or disease and malnutrition in the aftermath of this war. Contrary to popular opinion that it is just Africans killing each other, this war is a raid on the Congo by foreign mining companies which use Rwanda and Uganda and their rebel armies to steal the resources in the east of the country. Congo receives relatively little income from the official sales of raw materials and this income goes only to the people at the top. By far the biggest amount of resources are taken out of the country through illegal mining and smuggling. So far the report of Dr. Noor. I don't think any one of us can imagine what the Congolese people suffered in the last 130 some years and hardly anybody in the world is aware of it. That's why I believe this story needs to be published and we need to put an end to this crime on humanity. Lenka and I wish that all the children in Congo would have nutritious food, sufficient education and the opportunity to learn a trade that will benefit their future. We believe that better education and more agriculture, including the needed infrastructure like suitable roads, could raise the living standard in this country without too much expense. Congo has, outside of its huge area of woods and rainforests, 80 million hectares of agricultural land available. Instead of importing even basic food items, it could grow enough food in those vast untouched uh, stretches of land to feed itself and even export it as some other African nations do. They could grow and export coffee, cocoa and many fruits and vegetables like bananas, avocados, pineapples, papayas, as well as peanuts, coconuts and other nuts and fruits you have never seen. Their avocados are twice the size of the ones available here. On this photo you can see some of the fruits that I received um, from the farmers that I just visited there. Uh, this pineapple uh, is about, was about this big and weighed over three kilos. Okay, I brought you also some samples uh, from the Congo. Peanut butter lovers will relish this delicious, nutritious peanut butter made 100% out of peanuts, only roasted and ground up, nothing added. Uh, I also bought some 100% natural organic honey. It is super yummy and very healthy. Uh, if you like herbal teas, afterwards you can smell the strong aroma of this uh, lemongrass tea, uh, which I received in the countryside again when I was there. Uh, as you can see here, it is fresh lemongrass and here it is dried. Uh, snack lovers might enjoy this um, banana plantain snack, also very natural. I hesitate to uh, mention the fantastic wood that grows in Congo, as it would be a shame if more of their magnificent trees would be cut down, especially those in the rainforest, and if no new ones would be replanted. Anyway, I have some samples of carved woodwork, uh, made out of wenge wood, like uh, this relief of a mother with her baby and uh, this uh, rather robust elephant stool. You can afterwards come and, and, and hold it. You will see how heavy this wood is. It is so strong that even termites will not eat it. Okay, in 2007, we moved into a house in Kinshasa which was looted in one of the two nationwide lootings under Mobutu. The people took everything out of that house that was removable. I mean, everything. Even the toilets were gone and the wires were taken, the electric wires were taken out of the walls. They only left three things in that house. Two bathtubs which were cemented in and this table made from Wenge wood. It was so heavy that they could not carry it out of the house. As we personally do not have enough money and influence to bring about changes on higher levels and help on a larger scale, we do what we can to improve the situation in a few places 
and to show how positive change can be brought about even under difficult circumstances. Since the year 2000, Lenka and I have engaged in humanitarian aid projects in six African countries. We have lived in Africa for more than 10 years, and I continue to make yearly trips to inspect our projects in Congo and to consult with our team there. From our base in Prague, we organize and oversee the work in Congo by email, and we do our best to organize um, and, and uh, raise awareness and support for it. In the year 2000, Lenka assisted in medical camps in Nigeria for one year, while I helped friends in Guinea, Conakry, where I imported a 40-foot container with humanitarian aid. In 2001, together, we distributed maize uh, in the most, uh, for the most disadvantaged people in eastern Zambia who had lost most of their crops in floods. In 2002, we imported our second 40-foot container of humanitarian aid, this time in Cameroon, where we had our first contact with the most peaceful people we ever met, the pygmies, such wonderful and loving folks. In 2003, we moved to the Democratic Republic of Congo, where we imported our third 40-foot container in Africa. Later that year, Lenka had health issues and needed an operation in Europe. In 2005, we moved to the milder South Africa, where we helped friends in their work and where Lenka could recover. After her recovery, we returned with a new team of volunteers to Kinshasa, where we lived from 2007 to 2011. At that time, we shifted our focus to uh, underprivileged children, for whom we started a feeding program. In 2011, we experienced the appalling poverty of the countryside when we visited the village Mushapo, about 1,000 kilometers southeast from Kinshasa near Angola. The village chiefs asked us to build a school as they did not have one. As difficult as life is out there, we realized that if we did not build that school, then who will? We made bricks out of the ground right there and burned those bricks so we could make strong buildings. To reach Mushapo, we had to take old airplanes from Kinshasa to Chikapa, and from there we traveled by motorbike or by car 60 kilometers through the bush, which can take between 4 and 12 hours, depending on the rain and the road condition. Here you can see the three school buildings and the health center we built for them. In five years, more than 2,000 children attended this school free of charge, which is unheard of in Congo, as normally everybody there must pay school fees. In 2016, the same kind of fighting that is going on in eastern Congo started also in the Kasai provinces where our school is situated. The goal of this violence is always to drive out the local population so the resources can be extracted easier. It is the same tactic and most likely the same perpetrators as in East Congo. Thousands of people were brutally killed and 80 mass graves were found. More than one million people became refugees or internally displaced people and hundreds of schools were closed, including ours. Some schools and villages were destroyed, thank God ours was not. Most of our teachers and students had to flee with their families to Chikapa, where after many struggles, they could start teaching the children in the afternoon in another school building. After some time, our school in Mushapo was reopened, but only for the children of the Chokwe tribe, which forced out all the other tribes. In 2017, we started a new project in Mabala, where we built an agro-veterinary high school. Besides the normal school subjects, the children received training in agriculture and farming so they can earn a living instead of being jobless after their final exams. Here are some of the steps it takes to build such a school.
First, they put hard rocks mixed with cement into the foundation. Uh, in this case, the, the bricks were not burned because the clay soil in that region had too much sand for the burning process. So that's why we had to use cement mortar to build the walls. We also used iron bars and cement uh, to fortify the construction. The roof bars had to be uh, painted against the termites. And last, uh, outside, they, they covered the walls also with a cement mix to protect it against the rain. And then, as last, they put the floors and uh, the, the painting job inside and outside. We also started a new agricultural project by giving maize seeds to uh, farmers uh, here between Isaka and Lebama, where the, grace, the maize is growing very well. After the harvest, we buy the maize from them, uh, transport it up to Isaka, the river, from where it goes via three rivers, all the way down to Kinshasa. Uh, and in Kinshasa, our partner organization, BBK, is selling the maize, and the profit will go back up to help support the school. This is our second school, where the students attend classes free of charge. Now here you can see the location of Mushapo, Chikapa, the capital Kinshasa, and Mabala uh, near Nyoki. In order to give you a better picture about our work in Congo, we would like to show you now a short video of my recent visit there. Active Direct Help presents visiting our Mabala school and the agricultural project. In March, Wolfgang spent one month in Congo and had several fruitful meetings with our ADH Congo members and our partner organization BBK in Kinshasa. Discussed were the next steps of our school in Mabala, the agricultural project in the surrounding villages, as well as the schools in Mushapo and Chikapa. When Wolfgang arrived at the airport in Nyoki, he was greeted by the mayor of Nyoki, Mr. Mario, Maman Ani, our local manager, BBK members from Kinshasa and Nyoki, as well as teachers and students of our school. The lively music, songs and a big banner was their way of expressing their appreciation for this new school. At the school grounds, 290 pupils, 11 teachers and our school principal Philemon presented beautiful songs, poems and lines the students had learned in French and English. Thank you and you. I am okay. Where do you come from? I come from Mabala and you. I come from Nyoki. Where are you going now? I'm going to Itavadash Mabala. What are you doing there? Sorry, there we are learning a lot for preparing how a life comes. Come, come, come Mabala and Nyoki people to start feeling at Itavadash Mabala for receiving the formation of higher quality. After the presentation, I shared some words of encouragement and a prayer with the students, which they appreciated very much. I also gave them each a little poster with a message of God's love written on the back.
Our Agro Veterinary School Itaf Adeha Mabala is officially registered as a governmental school. As is the case with such schools in Congo, the government is not paying anything to support the school or the teachers. It can take many years before they start paying anything. Instead, we have to pay taxes for the salaries which BBK and Adeha give to the teachers. Then I visited their classrooms and enjoyed seeing the computers and printers which our partner organization BBK brought from Kinshasa. Outside they have a little generator to create electricity when they use the computers. The wood construction of the roof will still need to be painted inside to protect it from termites. The students were especially excited about the footballs and jerseys which a dear friend in Germany donated. Agronomist and school director Philemon is teaching the students how to grow little palm tree seedlings, which will be planted on the field around the school. He is also teaching them how to grow other plants and vegetables. This black earth is a special natural fertilizer made with ground up charcoal powder. It helps the seedlings to grow better. In order to visit the farmers, we have to first drive up the Fimi River from Nyoki to Isaka for 8 kilometers with a motorboat. Since it can take many years for the government to pay their teachers, we came up with a plan of how to make the school independent from outside support in the long run. Here is our twofold plan. To help the extremely poor farmers in the surrounding villages of the whole Kutu region, we are encouraging more maize plantations. You might remember the 500 kilos of maize seeds we brought to Mabala two years ago. It took a long time for this maize multiplication project to take root. The reason is that the farmers have no proper way to sell the products after harvest. If a farmer wants to sell, for example, 10 bags of maize in Kinshasa, he has to first find a way to transport those bags a long distance from the bush to the Fimi River in Nioki, which is very difficult. Wolfgang traveled 40 kilometers on this road by motorbike and he saw how poor those farmers are and how difficult the transport is for them. So we decided to buy the maize from the farmers. BBK as an NGO will ship it to Kinshasa, mostly on the Congo River, sell it there with the help of their Kinshasa members and then use the profit to support the school. This would help the farmers to grow more maize in the next season and it could hopefully eventually support the school. After the maize is harvested, it is dried and then taken off the cob and put into bags up to 100 or 120 kilos each. The fire helps to smoke the maize so it can be preserved for a long time. 
Then it has to be transported 40 kilometers by road to Isaka, from where it will be shipped on the Fimi River, the Kasai River, and the Congo River all the way to Kinshasa. Adeha pays agronomist Alain, a young energetic farmer, to oversee this project. We also gave him money to collect the first six tons of maize and bring them to the river. Soon another 12 tons should be harvested. Thank you all who support our work. We appreciate your help very much and hope you enjoy these pictures so you can see where you are helping. These precious children and farmers are thankful for your help as well. If you want to know more about our work in Africa, you can visit the website of our German NGO Active Direct Hilfe, in English, Active Direct Help. This website is in English and Czech, as well as in German and French. It has a lot of information with many photos and videos about our work since the year 2000. We decided to help the people in the countryside because there is the greatest need. At the same time, this offers a solution to the migration crisis as it goes to the root of its problem. Let me explain why some Africans become refugees looking for better life conditions elsewhere. Basically, all aid organizations in Congo are helping in the cities. The people in the interior of the country are mostly left to themselves. Because of this neglect of the rural regions, life is shaped by extreme poverty in the rural regions. This causes many people to leave their villages hoping to find a better life in the cities. Kinshasa, with about 12 million inhabitants, is already helplessly overcrowded and faces enormous challenges. The cities are growing continuously because of this constant stream of people fleeing rural poverty, which is multiplying the conflicts already existing in the city. Many young people from the villages go to the cities. From the cities, they want to go to the capital. And from the capital, they want to go, guess where? To Europe and the US. That is why we are focusing our help in the countryside. Why should we wait until more people start leaving their home in search for a better place to live? 
we could lessen the migration to Europe from Africa by covering people's basic needs like food, shelter, education and a job right where they live. But besides the small development projects we can do, things need to change on a higher level, national and international, and the available finances need to be better distributed and invested. We should not be surprised about so many refugees when in their own countries they do not have enough to eat or are driven out of their homes by war and violence. We also don't need to be afraid of foreigners. I've been a foreigner for the majority of my life, living in 14 different countries on four continents. Here is a little summary of steps which could help move Congo forward if they were implemented. Number one, stop the unfair and illegal exploitation of raw materials and the violence in the areas which are rich in resources. Number two, income of the state needs to be invested into the development of the country instead of ending up in the pockets of the elite. Number three, education and economic development is needed for the whole population so they can get their needs met, build political awareness and real democracy. After all we have done to help Africa and especially Congo in the last 19 years, we realize more and more that the greatest influence on the events in Congo depends on decisions made in the industrialized nations. For this reason, I have written a book about this subject and I am still looking for a publisher. We believe the best service we can offer Congo is an information campaign to spread the news about what is happening there and try to influence their national and the international policies concerning this country. The book is written in English and German and it is being translated into Czech right now. We are looking for publishers for these three language areas. We believe the book will not only help improve the living conditions for the people in the Congo, but could also help many people in the industrialized countries because I also cover other topics which I will shortly mention so you see a little bit what it is all about. So far we covered two points. Number one, life in the Congo and the poor countries. And number two, what can be done to change their situation. Chapter three in my book deals with challenges in the rich industrialized nations and how we can counter them. Things like stress, unhealthy food and work habits, too much screen time for adults and children, loneliness, depression, addictions, weapons of war and many other important matters. Chapter 4 introduces what I call the fifth dimension. Besides length, breadth, height and time, there exists another dimension which is invisible but very powerful. Chapter 5 describes miracles which we experienced in our personal lives. These miracles prove that the fifth dimension is not just an idea in our head, but it can be tangibly experienced in real life. The biggest miracle is selfless love, which I will write about in chapter 6, and I'd like to give a little insight into this theme now. Sometimes Lenka and I are asked, how did you end up building a school in the middle of the bush in Africa? Why do you like to help people in general? Why do you do it full-time as volunteers without a salary? This leads back to a special experience Lenka and I each had at separate occasions and at different times when we experienced deep love in such a strong way that it completely turned our lives around. We realized that this love uh, was the solution to our personal problems and for the world. It was like finding a remedy for AIDS and cancer. I believe the best way to change the world is by changing hearts, minds and attitudes. Our own first, 
Only then can we try to help others to do the same. From personal experience, I can affirm that love is the best way to change any heart. Let me clarify what I mean when I talk about love. The Hollywood type of love is unrealistic and superficial, and usually lasts only a short time. I'm talking about real love, which is active in helping someone else. Life is not about getting anything; it's all about giving. It gives something away, such as your time, or ourselves, or our resources. This kind of love is crucial. It is the key for changing the world. Without it, things will continue as they are today. The biggest obstacles we are facing today are all due to a lack of love, war, hunger, poverty, refugees, and the migration crisis are all a result of greed and selfishness. All the money and material wealth prove useless. In the most critical moments and aspects of life, when we or our loved ones are lonely, fall ill, or face the loss of a friend or a relative, we realize this truth: the most important things in life cannot be seen, touched, manufactured, sold, or bought. The things like friendship, happiness, peace, faith, hope, and love. They are not material. Another dimension is involved. The life-changing experience Lenka and I had was an overfilling of supernatural love, which we believe comes from God. It is most of all a personal relationship between God and us. We humans are naturally selfish, and our human love can only go so far. But this kind of love is supernatural and can go further. Love is a collective term which includes kindness, fairness, understanding, generosity, positiveness, and helpfulness. It is inclusive, respectful, forgiving, humble, patient, tolerant, and all these positive attributes, values, and virtues we would like to have. The difficulty we face is. How to apply love to our daily lives and the world around us? Here are some ideas of what love can do practically. Drug abuse, loneliness, and depression and suicide can be reduced if we spend time with people and show them some love. Giving, helping, and showing love to others create win-win situations. It helps those who are needy. And the person who shows them love. If you give something away or help somebody, love will come back to you. We all can share something with those who have less than we do. It does not hurt us. On the contrary, when we reach out and help others, we end up benefiting both them and ourselves. We need an attitude of love and act in love. Any family, company. Organization or government should be concerned about their team members, their co-workers, and their citizens. Companies and multinational corporations should think about the needs of the poor and not just their own economical profits. A good question to ask ourselves regarding any plans, decisions, and actions is this: Is it loving or not? If we act in love, we will not steal, lie, or cheat. We will not be lazy, contentious, or greedy. Instead, we will help others and lift each other up. Another form of love is to confront evil, to speak out against it, and do something to change it. In short, love applies the golden rule: whatever you wish that others do to you, do also to them. In other words, whatever you don't want others do to you, <clears throat> don't do it to them. Now you might think, what can I personally do to make a difference? Well, for one, you're not alone. There are other people and organizations who do their part to improve circumstances. Without their help, things would be much worse. And second, no one is an island. 
everyone has influence and can participate in changing their neighborhood and more. Here are some examples of what can be done. Speak up or write about injustice in the world and try to win people to do something about it. Find a needy situation and start a project or volunteer and help with or support an existing project. Mother Teresa said, if you cannot feed a hundred people, then just feed one. She also said, we cannot do great things on this earth, we can only do small things with great love. We don't have to do what she did. It is also not necessary to go to Congo to change the world. If we show love, consideration and kindness to the people around us, it will change our part of the world. Let's face it, the world has enough food, money and land for everybody. What we are lacking is enough love to share them. So let's work together in love, even with people who are different. Let's help the poor and needy in whichever way we can. Let's change the world with love. Thank you.